By the late 70s, family relationships between husbands and wives, parents and kids were being shaken up by both sexual liberation and sexual adventure. The 1970s was proving to be a real decade of tumult for the British family. And we were bombarded with troubling tales of domestic life. Families could be dysfunctional. and finish making your little sandwich. Families could be torn apart by sexual passions and tensions. Shut up! Mummy, did you know Daddy's been screwing his secretary in our flat while we were away? And families could be destroyed by violence. Erin Pitsy had tired of seeing women violently abused by their husbands. So she set up the first refuge for battered wives in Chiswick in West London. Ah, oh, this, this is the little house. This is Two Belmont Terrace, where it all started. There were 56 mothers and children in there. That's me, looking exhausted in the little cubby hole that was the only place we had to talk privately. And they'd tell secrets that they'd never told anybody in their lives, ever. These are very sad, these photographs. This one particularly, this, this lost, lonely little girl, so inappropriately dressed and unkempt with the two black bags beside her, which is how they used to come to the refuge with black bags. That's all they had. The refuge was literally women's liberation, women freeing other women from family situations that had become too dangerous. And that rattled some cages. The local vicar used to preach against me, he said I was a marriage wrecker. Um, the local MP basically wouldn't help at all. Nobody wanted to talk about this problem. I was struggling just to be able to keep the door open because although we had it for a peppercorn rent, we couldn't get any money to feed the, the mothers and children because the DHSS said, yes, but you've got partners and husbands to go back to. And social workers would, the, would, would say, yes, but he wants her back, he loves her. You know, and you say you don't love somebody if you smash their face in. And Ian Pitsy tells you when you walk through Cheswick doors, you've hit rock bottom. No lower can you go. <coughs> Only one way you can go, and that's up. Pick yourself up. What do you think would happen to mothers like you if this place was closed down and you had to go away? Go to a halfway house or go back to her husband's. And personally, with my own husband, I'm being straight with you right now, I'd go back to him in a minute, but I'd kill him. I will. And you can I'd wait till he was sleeping and I'd stab the man. Our families were being depicted as a war zone, where men were the enemy. For some in the women's movement, a series of murders in the north of England seemed to confirm the ever-present threat of male violence. Patricia Atkinson, found murdered, Bradford, 1977. Helen Ritter, Over the past four years, 12 women have been horribly murdered and mutilated by a sick, sadistic maniac, the Yorkshire Ripper. Now, uh, could we have some quiet, please? Thank you, David. Right. The police inspector behind me this evening has come about a very serious matter which we all know about. I've come here tonight to play you a tape of the man who we believe to be the so-called Yorkshire Ripper. I think it's 11 now, isn't it? I can't see myself being nicked just yet. During the manhunt, the police were staggered by the numbers of men cruising red light areas in northern cities. Over 150,000 vehicles were checked out. Hundreds of women wrote to the police, saying they thought the Yorkshire Ripper was their husband. 
The Ripper investigation had revealed some unpalatable truths about family life. In May 1981, Peter Sutcliffe was convicted of murdering 13 women. He is my son, and I want every father in the country to be glad that it was my son and not theirs. It could have been anybody's son. Just weeks later, there were crowds on the streets in an altogether different mood. Well, I'm at the moment standing right at the edge of Green Park, and behind that fence, and back through about 40 or 50 rows of people, is where it all happened a few minutes ago. Did any of you manage to see anything? You saw Lady Diana. What did you think of her? She's lovely. She rides to St Paul's as a commoner. She was, of course, fantastically well-connected. She was a lady. She was a teenager. She was beautiful. And most importantly of all, for our king in waiting, she was a virgin. Love is Charlie and I. For a short while, at least, we seemed to forget that we had just lived through a decade of rampant sexual freedom and women's liberation. So many of us so wanted to believe in this fairy tale marriage, clinging on to an idea of a Britain that was fading away. Who were we kidding? On millions of British family bookshelves was a novel about a broken family, about strong, independent women, and, of course, about sex. He slowly pulled up her skirt and she felt his hand on the naked flesh below her panties. Then he slid his hand under the delicate lace. I wrote lace, and when I heard that 14 and 15 year olds were passing it around in brown paper wrappers, I was really thrilled because it had got to my audience. I was one of those 14 and 15 really? year olds. Oh. And the extraordinary thing about lace was, of course, it was incredibly explicit. Pagan sat upon him as his hands tickled her erect pink nipples. She could feel him high inside as he thrust against the core of her. I think the main point about that book was it was a novel written about sex from the woman's point of view. It's, it's racy stuff, it's explicit. Well, the Princess of Wales said, you're a very naughty girl. And I think, actually, it sold by the bucketful. Books like Lace illustrated just how far women had come in 20 short years and, by turn, how much the landscape of the British family had changed. They said that it was all right to be single, to be sexual, and maybe most importantly of all, to be successful. And the desire to do better for your family is the strongest driving force in human nature. <laughs> 